Mr. Dean, President, faculty, staff, the board, friends, family, your graces, the archbishops, students especially. It's wonderful to be with you. It's wonderful to be home. As most of you know, or many of you know, my wife and I are kind of unapologetic Canadians, but I must say, being in Pittsburgh is the closest thing we have to being home. <laughs> uh, Wendy and I collect homes, uh, but, but this is certainly uh, right up at the top of the list. Wonderful to be here. Uh, I want to apologize, first of all, I've never done a commencement address before. I'm not quite sure what it is. Uh, I've been accused of, of teaching too much when I preach and preaching too much when I teach, so there might be a, a little bit of some of those things mixed in here. Uh, I want to say one other thing before, before I begin, so if you're timing me, don't start yet. Uh, and that is that there is, there is one thing missing at this ceremony, and that is a really, really strong descant. A while ago, I stumbled onto an internet controversy. It's not so unusual, of course. The internet exists for two reasons. One is so that we can relieve the stress of life by watching cute cat videos. <laughs> and the second is to breed controversy and disagreement. The particular dispute I discovered had to do with statistics regarding pastors leaving the ministry. I remember hearing about someone's first day in engineering school. The professor apparently told everyone to look at the student on their right or their left and then said, one of the two of you will not graduate from this program. Maybe this was an urban legend, but here's what they say on the interweb at least about pastors, that 50% of those ordained will leave the ministry within five years. I don't know if it's true or not. When I tried to get accurate information on pastoral and priestly attrition on the web, the stories and statistics and studies all seemed to contradict each other. Several said that 1,700 pastors leave the ministry every month in the United States. Some say, no, 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 it's only 1,500. Others say both of these statistics are exaggerated. Even if some statistics about clergy leaving the ministry are overstated, and of course we know that 70% of all statistics are lies, <laughs> or is it 75%? <laughs> it seems clear enough that the job is not easy. The pastoral ministry has extraordinary pressures and that many become disillusioned, disenchanted, and disappointed. Some people only leave the, not only leave the ministry, but leave the faith. Even worse, some leave the faith, but stay in parish ministry because they don't know what else to do. Or some become seminary professors. <laughs> or bishops. <laughs> it used to be... Uh, that clergy were among the most admired and respected members of society. No more. Often they are not trusted and even feared, with sometimes good reason. And so we have become like Rodney Dangerfield. We don't get no respect. And so that's why some pastors leave the ministry. They're not getting the respect they expected. A fair percentage leave due to moral failure. There's a problem that, all, that most clergy have, or at least there are a cluster of problems that the clergy have, to whine, to shine, and to recline. Uh, we can talk about those later if you want. Moral failure is true of clergy the world over. It's not a problem confined to North America with its particular temptations. One of the saddest parts of being a bishop is having to withdraw the license of a priest who has misbehaved 
and has not repented. In North America, however, most leave because of what we would call job dissatisfaction. And the main reason for this malaise is conflict, contention. One study done through an institute related to Fuller Theological Seminary says the number one reason that people leave the ministry is organizational and control issues in the parish. In other words, denominational or congregational conflict, disputes, quarrels, and disagreements lead to unhappy leaders, leaders who feel like failures, even if they aren't, people who feel defeated and unappreciated, even if they may actually be doing a very good job. A short while ago, I found a story uh, from a Christianity Today writer named Peter Chin. He says this, Over the past 15 years of pastoral ministry, I've contemplated quitting at least three times. The first was when I had to dedicate a tiny baby who had passed away after being born three months premature. The second was when my wife was diagnosed with cancer, but the time I most seriously considered quitting took place in the living room of a church member. He and I had been in almost constant conflict over the course of two years. I was at his house to try to figure out what the problem was and how we might fix it. With my head in my hands, I poured out my heart to this man. I considered my brother in Christ, sharing all the woes and fears that I had faced that year. Break-ins at my home, my wife's cancer diagnosis, our meager attendance at church. My voice choked with emotion. I confessed to him I really could use a break. He looked at me and with a flat voice, dripping with contempt, muttered, You are just so emotional. Speechless, I stared at him. I realized then that he didn't see me as I saw him, as a brother in Christ. I was his enemy, worthy only of his derision, not his compassion. As he met my stare with a stony one of his own, I pledged to myself, That's it. I quit. For months and even years after this experience, I struggled to comprehend why this man viewed me with such disdain. And the only thing I could discern was that his entire small group seemed to collectively hold a pretty dim view of me as their pastor. Well, since Peter Chin could get personal, maybe I should too. Just a couple of quick stories from ancient history. My first year of ordained ministry over 30 years ago. I had been a deacon for only a few weeks. A young woman came to see me for a pastoral problem. Within a few minutes, she had propositioned me in my office. The good news, I said no. More good news, it hasn't happened again. But at the time, it made me wonder, what in the world have I got myself into? Is the pastoral ministry always going to have this kind of problem forced on me as a pastor? And I can't say that they didn't tell me about this in seminary. They did. I guess I just didn't expect it. Second story, a little longer. Less than a year later, it was Christmas Eve, five minutes before midnight, the first year of my ordained ministry. I was privileged to be in a great church, quietly charismatic, faithful people. The church was full most Sundays. Uh, It was absolutely packed to the gills on Christmas Eve. The rector and I agreed that one of the elements of the service should be a play done by two members of the youth group. It was six minutes long. It was thoughtful. It was Christmas a Christmas play focused on God's love as seen in the incarnation of Jesus. Perfect. But we didn't ask the organist, who just happened to be the rector's wife, who just happened to be, want to be ordained but had been turned down, who really thought that she should have my job, who had unhappy childhood memories of Christmas, and who had worked really hard to get a fabulous music program together for Christmas Eve. And then this idiot curate added six minutes to the service. 
So you got the scene. It's five minutes before midnight. Maybe I should say it was five minutes to showtime, because that's how it felt. The rector was in the church doing some pre-service announcements. My job was simple, besides reading the gospel and distributing the cup. The rector was the preacher and the celebrant, and that was appropriate. I had one job to do, pray with the choir. The choir is lined up in the hall, and the organist enters the hall, sees me, and for the next three minutes, literally yells at me in front of the choir and tells me how horrible I am to have gone over her head and destroy the most important night of the year. Exit the organist into the church to begin the processional hymn. Uh, oh, come, let us adore him, I believe. <laughs> I'm left in the hall with a rather stunned and silent choir. It's now two minutes to midnight. What do I do? I looked at the choir, who were looking at me quietly, and said, let us pray. That was my job. One wonders at a moment like that whether this is what ministry is. Maybe this is the kind of thing that they don't prepare you for in seminary. Because even if they do talk about this kind of thing in seminary, dealing with difficult people is not the same thing as to actually live with them. Seminary cannot prepare you for everything. Both of these stories may seem trivial, and in a way they are. They are both about a pale young curate caught by surprise by the brokenness of people's lives. Far worse stories could be told. At the same time that I was going through these little struggles, a wonderful pastoral friend of mine, ordained only a year or two before me, was struggling with very difficult issues of his own sexual brokenness, and at the same time needing to deal with the meaning of the horrible death of a child in his parish and how he could possibly comfort the grieving family. In many parts of the world, including the part of the world I live in now, the struggle is even more direct. The house of one of my lay readers was burned down this year by the leader of another denomination in his, in his town who was jealous that the Anglican Church was doing so well there. A few years ago, the leader of our Somali congregation in Addis Ababa returned to Somalia to visit family and was murdered, martyred. Talk to Archbishop Ben Kwashi about what people go through in northern Nigeria. A few months ago, as you probably all know, 20 Egyptians and one Ghanaian were, were martyred on a beach in Libya. A few weeks later, almost 150 Kenyans Christian students were murdered in northern Kenya, and then just recently, 28 Ethiopians were again martyred in Libya. The struggles of North American pastors look pretty small next to the life and death realities of ministry in some parts of the world. Well, where can we go to get help in sorting out the reality of suffering in a pastoral context. Perhaps the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians, that strangely neglected letter, is a good place to turn. Paul had more than his share of pastoral war stories, some of which he he recounts in this epistle. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, for example, is a list of Paul's suffering speaking into the context of a divided and spiritually proud congregation, he says this, Let no one think me foolish, but even if you do, accept me as a fool, so that I too may boast a little. What I am saying with this boastful confidence, I say not as the Lord, not as the Lord would, but as a fool, since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. If you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourself, 
For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you or devours you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, remember, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman, of course, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. The bishops in the room get that part. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. Paul's list of sufferings in this chapter follows a pattern well known in the Roman world. The Corinthian readers, since they were members of a Roman colony, would have understood what Paul is doing in this text. For this is a parody of a Roman military award known as a corona muralis, the crown wall. From the time of the Roman Republic, this award, an actual crown, formed in the shape of a fortified city and made of real gold, was presented to a Roman soldier who was the first up and over the wall at the siege of a city. It wasn't awarded very often because, of course, the soldier had to survive the battle to receive the reward. Apparently, at the awarding of this crown, the soldiers' most daring feats would uh, would be recounted, climaxing with the declaration that he had been the first over the wall at such and such a place when the glorious empire had defeated and sacked the city. Paul has reversed the imagery of bravery of battle, and instead of being the first into the city to fight the enemy, Paul speaks of his running away, of his fleeing the city over the wall in the wrong direction. No boasting of bravery here. Paul is boasting of his escape, his humiliation, his weakness. What is Paul doing here? He is asserting that ministry is not a matter of success. Although it's always nice when good things happen in ministry. Rather, the ministry is a matter of faithful service. Following Jesus, Paul says, does not mean riding into a city on a war horse to conquer. It means escaping the city over the wall in a basket. Paul is following the pattern of the ministry of Jesus that we find recounted in Philippians 2, 5 to 11, which one recent New Testament scholar calls Paul's master story. The story that controls his theology and his life and his ministry. That Jesus did not grasp or snatch at equality with God, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, humbling himself, becoming obedient unto death, even death on a cross. The way of ministry then And not just the ministry of Jesus, but the ministry of his people, both lay and ordained. The ministry is the way of the cross. Every pastor has stories to tell. 
Everyone involved in any kind of ministry has stories to tell. Stories of temptation, conflict, and frustration. Lots of pastors end up saying, how did I get into this? Is this what learning exegesis and Greek and Hebrew and liturgy and homiletics and missiology and early medieval reformation and modern church history are for? I didn't sign up for this. Well, actually you did. You signed up not when you decided to go to seminary. You signed up when you gave your life to Jesus. Or perhaps, if you were baptized as a baby at least, you were signed up for this by your parents and your godparents when they brought you to baptism. The life of a pastor with its particular problems and frustrations and, yes, sufferings, is simply a microcosm of the suffering to which every disciple of Jesus is called by virtue of baptism and faith. We are called to follow Jesus on the way to the cross. The great Diedrich Bonhoeffer said it, when Christ calls someone, he bids that person come and die. If you don't believe Bonhoeffer, then listen to Jesus. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. When Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, some of his disciples were beginning to wonder if he was now going to take up his throne, drive out the Romans, and restore the nation to Israel. They're still asking that question on Ascension Day, actually. And so a couple of them, with help from their mom, decided to get in first dibs for the best seats. You remember the story. James and John want seats at the right hand and at the left when Jesus comes in his kingdom. What is Jesus' response? He doesn't say, you fools. He says, can you be baptized with the baptism with which I am going to be baptized? Sure, they say. No sweat. No problem. Hakuna matata. <laughs> we say in Ethiopia, chigarellum. No problem. They didn't have a clue. Because evidently they had not been listening. He is going to a throne. He is taking up his crown. He will receive his royal robes. But the throne is a cross. The crown is made of thorns and the royal robes will be his own nakedness as he is exposed to the shame and degradation of crucifixion. And we who claim to follow Jesus are told at least in the Lucan version, take up your cross daily and follow me. Some mistakenly think that Luke's version waters it down by saying daily. Not so. Every day you must live as if the possibility of martyrdom is before you. Every day means living a life given over, surrendered. Do you know the old gospel song? I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Paul helps us to see how we can do this, how we can live this surrendered life, once again in the second letter to the Corinthians, this time in chapter 4. But we have this treasure, the gospel, the good news of the death and resurrection of Jesus, which has changed the world. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, 
but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to, the, to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So why stay in ministry, whether that ministry be lay or ordained ministry? Why stay even though it is hard? Because, first of all, people need life. People need to hear about God's love revealed in Jesus and to see it demonstrated in our lives. They need life. The church is suffering, not just the pastors. And God is seeking pastors to help bind up the brokenhearted. One of the wonders of ministry is that people let you into the most significant parts of their lives. And to bring Jesus with you into those lives. People need life. And Jesus said that he came that we might have life and life in abundance. And so as his ministers, we don't lose heart because we are bringing life to people. Secondly, we stay in ministry because the ministry is not about us. It is about God. Chapter 4, verse 7, Paul says, We have this treasure in earthen vessels so that people will see the surpassing power that belongs to God and not to us. What is that power? What is the power which says we can endure the cross despising the shame? It is the power of the resurrection. Paul says, Knowing that God, the God who raised the Lord Jesus, will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Ministry is about God, the God who raises the dead. It is about God's glory. Paul says in verse 15 that the motivation for ministry and mission is not our glory, not our well-being, but God's name, God's glory. And therefore, finally, Paul says, we do not lose heart. Sadly, many do lose heart. Many are deceived into thinking that ministry is about achieving benchmarks, about successful building programs, about numbers of converts. I do not despise buildings. I'm trying to build some now. Uh, I'm not, uh, not against uh, c- converts, certainly, Uh, Every convert is a person. Every convert is a sinner who repents, who, who makes the angels throw a party. I'm not even against ministry goals and devising plans to meet them. I'm all for strategy and thinking things through. But be prepared. Strategies need to be revised. Plans sometimes fail. And goals are hard to achieve. But all of these good things pale beside the call to serve faithfully and humbly. We do not lose heart, Paul says. 
Why? Because this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Yes, we are, Paul says, jars of clay, earthen vessels, as the King James puts it. And clay jars can leak, can crack, can break. We are weak, but he is strong. Within these vessels, we carry the greatest treasure ever known, the message that God has come to us in Jesus, that he has given himself for us on the cross, that he was raised. And because of this, the world has changed. There is a new creation. The cosmos, the universe, is not the same. Because of this change in the very nature of the creation, the last enemy, death, will not, cannot win. And so our ministry, your ministry, whether you are in a lay or ordained capacity, is a participation in the great ministry of God, the ministry of bringing life to the world and glory to God the Father. Amen. Thank you.